Section 10 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Section 10. Chapter 7. Part 1. Brothers All. What's the use talking, Morris? Abe Potash protested. The fella couldn't even talk ten words English at all. Sure, I know, Morris Perlmutter admitted. But he would quick learn. Quick learn, Abe exclaimed. What do you mean, quick learn? Nowadays I never seen the like. A greenhorn comes here from Rusland, which he's such an ignoramus he don't even know his own name, understand me, and he expects right away to get a job? In a cloak and suit concern uptown? Where they would learn him how he should talk English? And at the same time paying ten dollars a week? Actually, Morris, them fellas think they're doing you a favor if they ruin ten garments a day on you in exchange for learning them English. Me, when I come over from Rolissant, I was also so grossartic. I was glad to get a job learning on shirts in a sub cellar, and the boss borrowed me for wages. I got an elegant bill of fare, too, I bet you, Morris. Every day for dinner, salt and herring and potatoes, except Sundays, his onions extra. And did that fellow learn me English, Morris? Oh, sir, Stuck, I must go to night school to learn English, Morris. And I did, Morris, and they learnt me good there, Morris. And so this here fella you're talking about, he should do the same. We wouldn't got to learn him English, Abe, Morris declared. The fellow's a bright, smart fella, and he could pick it up quick enough. Sure, I know, Abe rejoined. And pick it up a whole lot of other things, too, Morris. Silks and velvets and buttons and fellas picks up. Not this fella, Abe. Morris said. He's from a decent, respectable people in the old country. He's studying for a doctor already when he comes over here. But he gets into trouble on account he belongs to a politics society over there, so he's got to run away. The fellow's a bright fella, Abe. I know them bright fellas, Morris. Sit up till all hours of the night in Canal Street coffee houses, killing off Grand Dukes. Grand Dukes has got to make a living the same like anybody else, Morris. And anyhow, Morris, when a fella comes over here from Russell and Morris, he ain't got no business bothering his head about Grand Dukes. The way things is nowadays in the cloak and suit trade, Morris, a fella's got all he could attend to holding on to his job. Morris shrugged. Let's give the fella a show anyhow, Abe, he rejoined. And if you don't soon make good, we quick fire him, you understand? That's what you said about that fella, Harkavy which we give him a job in our cutting room, Morris. All the time he works for us acts so dumb like a ten-year-old child. And soon as we fire him, Morris, he goes to work by climbing in Ellenbogen and turns out a couple of styles, which the least them highwaymen makes out of him is five thousand dollars. How should I know what Harkavy could do with climbing in Ellenbogen, Abe? Morris cried. You're the prophet of this here concern, Abe. Always you're predicting to me tomorrow what's going to happen yesterday. Well, what's forby is forby, Morris, Abe retorted. And if I gotta stand here all day and schmooze with you, Morris, go ahead and hire the fella. Only one thing I'm saying to you, Morris, don't tell me afterward that I was in favor of the fella from the start, cause I ain't. With this ultimatum, Abe glanced toward the cutting room, where sat a tall, stooping figure, holding in his hands a peaked cap. Only to look at the fella gives me a crank, Morris, Abe continued. So if you're going to hire him, Morris, do me the favor and give him a couple of dollars out of the safe so you should get a shave and a haircut and a new hat. Morris nodded and started for the cutting room when Abe called him back. For my part, Morris, I don't care what people says, you understand, he declared. But if we got a couple of them 34th Street buyers around here and they sees our work people has got such shoes which the toes sticking out already, Morris, what do they think of us? Am I right or wrong? Sure, I know. Morris said. But, but nothing, Morris, Abe concluded. For three dollars we should make suckers out of ourselves. Don't stand there like a fool, Morris. Give the fella five dollars. He should buy himself a pair of shoes and ferdy. The transformation begun in Caesar Kovalenko by a haircut. And the shave was made complete when Morris, accompanied by Kovalenko's cousin, went with him to a retail clothing establishment. There, Caesar discarded forever his cap, top boots, and frogged overcoat, and emerged, but for his vocabulary, a naturalized citizen of the cloak-and-suit trade. 
Now all he's got to do, Morris said, is to work hard, and we would quick be making good wages. Sure, sure, the cousin replied. At first, maybe you'd be a little dumb on account you got a whole lot of experiences lately. Experiences? Morris asked. What for experiences? Well, in the first place, the cousin proceeded, two years ago he's studying for a doctor in the University of Harkov, and next door to him, one house by the other, lives a fellow which ain't got nothing to say against him, you understand? Only he goes to work and sends a package to the chief of police, Mr. Perlmutter. When they open the package, you understand, inside is something fixed mind you mr perlmutter i wouldn't say nothing if it would be really the chief of police which would open the package but always it's some poor schnorrer which the chief of police calls in from the street this time it was a fellow by the name of levin a decent respectable young fellow his father was a rav the old man is coming over this week you understand mr perlmutter but when the chief of police sends out levin in the back yard he should open the package understand me that's the last anyone sees either from the package or either from levin Morris clicked his tongue sympathetically. And what they done to this fellow which sends the package? he asked. Him they didn't done nothing, Mr. Promoter, the cousin replied. But Caesar here, they put all on him. First they making him arrested, and then the police pretty near kill him, and the Cossacks take him from Harkov to Odessa, he should get tried, and then they pretty near kill him there, and if it wouldn't be that we're sending over to give a judge there a couple of thousand rubles, they would right away shoot him. Anyhow, Mr. Perlmutter, one year my cousin sits in prison there, and then we're sending over a couple of thousand rubles more, which give him the fella what runs the prison, and so my cousin sneaks out of there, and he comes over here to this country. Morris gazed at the neatly clad figure, who walked quietly along beside him. You wouldn't think it to look at him, he said, but anyhow, I do my best to see he gets a good show, and he would quick learn, I bet you. By this time they had reached Potash and Perlmutter's premises, and the cousin shook hands warmly with Morris. You got a good heart, Mr. Perlmutter, he declared fervently, and you wouldn't lose money supposing you did pay him eight dollars a week to start. Morris paused before passing indoors. Listen here to me, he said. Maybe I got a good heart, maybe I ain't. But your cousin starts on five dollars a week, understand me? And if he gets six dollars inside of a month, he would got to earn it. Despite this assertion, however, it was barely three weeks before Caesar Kovilenko was earning and receiving eight dollars a week, for never in their business experience had Abe and Morris employed a more intelligent workman. Not only did he exhibit great promise as an assistant cutter, but he had acquired a knowledge of English sufficient for his needs. If the fellow keeps on, Abe, Morris said, we would soon got to give him another raise. He's a wonder. Abe nodded gloomily. You can get all the wonders you want, Morris. To learn cunning at eight dollars a week, he said, and supposing he does pick up English quick, Morris, the fellow could be a regular Henry Shakespeare, you understand, and he would be any better a garment cutter on that account. Am I right or wrong? Well, certainly it don't do no harm that Kovalenko understands a little English, Morris commented. Sure not, Abe agreed satirically, because the quicker he learns English, Morris, the quicker he would copy our styles and find a job with a competitor. Take this here, Harkovy, for instance. Only this morning I seen Felix Geigerman in the subway, and he says that Kleiman and Ella Bogan is showing at a dollar less on the garment, a ringer for our style, 4022, which we sold him, Morris. Now, who tells them suckers how they could cut down on the buttons in the lining, Morris, and put one pleat less on the skirt, Morris? I suppose you did, or I did, Morris, ain't it? He paused for a reply, but none came. And yet, Morris, he concluded, that fellow Harkovy was a wonder, too, and I suppose, Morris, that the way he picked up English would be a big consolation to us, Morris, if a good customer like Geigerman leaves us and goes over to Kleiman and Ellenbogen. Morris grunted scornfully. You're all the time looking for trouble, Abe, he said. If we would lose as many customers as you're talking about, Abe, we wouldn't got a decent concern left on our books at all. You got to give Geigerman credit for knowing a good garment when he sees it. Sure, I know, Morris, Abe replied. Geigerman knows a good garment when he sees it, but his customers don't. 
if geigerman could get it for a dollar less than ours garments would look like ours and is like ours all but the buttons and the pleats and the skirt we could kiss ourselves good-bye with business no matter how many bright green horns we got it in our cutting room Gevig, morris exclaimed you don't know what you're talking about abe nevertheless when felix geigerman the well-known harlem dry goods merchant and violin dilettante entered potash and pearl mutter's showroom the next morning morris greeted him with some misgiving hello felix he said you giving us a repeat order so soon already on them four o two twos felix shook his head i got a few words to say to abe morris he replied is he in now morris smiled amiably although he was convinced that felix visit voted a cancellation of the four o two twos he ain't in now he answered but if you wait a few minutes he'll be right back he returned hastily to the office for he knew that if abe found them in conversation on his return he would impute the cancellation of the order to something morris had said thus felix was left alone in the showroom save for caesar kovalenko who plied a feather duster industrially among the sample racks as he worked caesar whistled russian melody half sad half cheerful and felix paused midway in the lighting of his cigar it was the opening theme in the second movement of tchaikovsky's fourth symphony and caesar's rendition of it was not only true to pitch but he managed to introduce certain nuances that to felix proclaimed the born musician what's that you're whistling he inquired and caesar smiled tchaikovsky's fourth symphony he replied and then he reached around to his hip pocket see i got music he handed a paper-covered miniature score to geigerman who opened it at random ha felix exclaimed as his eye lit on a familiar phrase in the last movement he hummed it over and caesar joined him in a clear musical baritone they were thus engaged when a tall broad-shouldered individual entered the showroom sorry to interrupt you gentlemen he said but is the boss in in the back office there felix replied will you tell him mr gunther would like to see him the newcomer continued i will if you want me to felix said but i'm here only a customer excuse me mr gunther apologized i was talking about the other fellow however he proceeded to the office and engaged morris in earnest conversation for several minutes they returned to the showroom just as caesar was replacing the score in his hip pocket the motion was too much for mr gunther whose occupation made him nervous and he plunged his hand into his overcoat and brought out a shiny metallic object there was a sharp struggle and caesar kovalenko leaned against the partition with his wrists encircled by a pair of handcuffs come along quiet said mr gunter calmly or i'll knock your block off at this juncture the elevator door banged open and abe came into the showroom what's the matter here he cried mr gunter smiled i am a united states deputy marshal he proclaimed and i'm arresting this guy under a warrant duly issued in the southern district of new york i got a taxicab downstairs and if any of you gentlemen is a friend of the prisoner you can come along to the marshal's office morris darted into the office and reappeared with his hat and coat abe he said you stay here in the store i'll go down with him abe frowned one moment morris he cried i didn't go so quick as all that first we would find out what he makes this young feller arrested for the deputy marshal nodded that's all right you're entitled to know it he's arrested on the complaint of the russian consulate for something he did in russia two years ago in russia abe exclaimed two years ago morris do me a favor you stay in the store and i go with him felix geigerman placed his hand on abe's arm say looky here abe he said i'll tell you the truth 
I'm pretty busy today here to cancel them 4022s, but now I don't care at all. You could ship them goods if you want to, Abe. But one thing I ask you is a favor. Let me go with him. I don't care what the other fellow says. I'm just now talking to this here young fellow, and if he done anything in Russia, understand me, I would eat it. So you stay here, attend to business, and I'll go with him. Morris drew on his overcoat with force sufficient to rip the sleeve lining. Nathan, the shipping clerk, attend to the store, Abe, he declared, and we'll all go with him. In the first place, Morris, Abe said, after they had returned from the United States Commissioner's office, where Caesar Kovalenko had been arraigned and committed without bail to the tombs, in the first place, what are we bothering our heads about this young fellow? Of course, when I was down there, Morris, and see the fellow from the Russian counsel's office, which he's got a face, Morris, hard like iron, you understand? I didn't say nothing, but the way you're going to work a telephone to Henry D. Feldman and everything, Morris, before we get through with him, it would cost us anyhow a couple of hundred dollars. Geigerman said he'd go half, Morris said. Sure, I know, Morris, but just because Geigerman acts like a sucker, Morris, why should we get ourselves into it, too? Furthermore, Morris, how do we know Geigerman would go half? He's that kind of a fellow, Morris. When he says something, he don't take it so particular he should stick to it, Morris. One day he gives us an order, and the next day he cancels it, Morris, and that's the kind of man he is. He didn't cancel it, Abe, Morris cried. He was going to cancel, but he changed his mind. Sure, he changed his mind, Abe interrupted. And what's going to hinder him changing his mind on the other proposition, Morris? He could take it from me, Morris, when the time comes he should pay up. Understand me? It'll be a case of next visit. And don't you forget it. Morris shrugged impatiently. No, hey, what could we do? Once in a while, we couldn't help ourselves. You understand? Should we let this poor greenhorn be sent back to Ruslan? And he ain't got a relative in the world, understand me, except his cousin, which he's just as poor as Kovalenko. That's all right, Morris, Abe declared. I ain't kicking we should help the fellow. All I'm saying is there's lots of our people which be got more dollars as we got dimes. Take Moses M. Storyman, for instance. That's a fellow which he's got a big charity fellow, understand? Why shouldn't he help Kovalenko? Well, in the first place, no one tells him about it, Abe, Morris said. And in the second place, but why don't we tell him about it, Morris? Abe interrupted. Why don't you go now to see him, Morris, and tell him all about it? Me go down to see him, Abe? Morris cried. Why, the fellow's a multimillionaire with such people like that. I couldn't open my mouth at all. Why don't you go now to see him? Why should I go down? Abe asked. You're the lodge brother here, Morris, ain't it? You're the one which you're always sitting up there till all hours of the night making motions. I couldn't make a motion to save my life, Morris. You know it. Sure, I know. Morris protested. But lodge meetings is something else again. You know, a fella could talk at a lodge meeting, and what is it? A couple of young lawyers, which they couldn't even pay their laundry bills, you understand? And a dozen other fellas, insurance brokers, or the cigar dealers, and most of them old-timers at that. Why should I be afraid to say a little something to them? But with a fellow like Moses M. Steuermann, which his folks is bankers in Frankfurt on the Main, when Carnegie and Vanderbilt, with all them other goyim, was a new beginners yet, Abe, that's a different proposition entirely. Abe nodded and remained silent for a few minutes. Might Felix Geigerman would go down and see him, Morris, he suggested finally. Wouldn't do no harm, we should ring him up anyhow. Go as far as you like, Abe, Morris said, and Abe started immediately for the telephone. I spoke to Felix, Morris he announced a few minutes later, and Felix said he'd go right down and see him. He ain't so stuck up on paying Feldman a couple hundred dollars neither. Morris snorted indignantly. If he's going to be charitable, Abe, he said, why don't you be a sport? We could easy stand a couple hundred dollars. That's all right, Morris, Abe declared. Business is business and charity is charity, you understand? But even in charity, Morris, it don't do no harm to keep the expenses down. Two hours afterward, Felix Geigerman entered the showroom, his face glistening with perspiration. "'Well, boys,' he almost shouted. "'I seen him, and he says he will call in here on his way uptown.' "'Who would call in?' Morris asked. "'Moses M. Steuermann, Felix replied. "'It was a Tchaikovsky fourth that fixed him, Morris. "'I told him the young fella carries round with him an orchestral score, "'and right away he says he'd come up. 
for years i see mr stroyum at the philharmonics and the boston symphony's mars i didn't know who he was at all i always thought it was something to do with music publishing concern stroyum got something to do with the music publishing concern morris exclaimed i'm surprised to hear you, you should talk that way felix well when you see in year in and year out a fellow goes to every concert what is felix explained naturally you get an idea he's in the music business ain't it that's what you think felix abe said taking up the cudgels in defense of stoyerman but you could take it from me felix if a fellow like stoyerman seemingly fools away his time at concerts understand me he ain't doing it for nothing he probably gets some business out of it same like a lot of fellows you would think is making suckers of themselves going to lodge meetings felix most of em sells many a big bill of goods that way that ain't here nor there abe felix rejoined the point is stroyerman would be up here at five o'clock so what are you going to tell him when he calls me tell him abe cried why i wouldn't be here at all i gotta go now see but now customer prince clarence you ain't got to do nothing of the kind abe morris retorted angrily you're going to stay right here and talk to that fellow when he comes what do you think i'm going to be the goat every time what's the matter abe felix asked are you afraid of the fellow he couldn't eat you up abe what do you mean afraid of him abe exclaimed i'm seen by big merchants every day felix i could talk right up to them too but this here my partner's affair he gave kovalenko in the first place and what's the use talking abe morris interrupted if you go home i go home so you got to stay and we would both see the fellow what's the difference supposing the fellow does got a couple of million dollars a couple of million dollars felix said why i bet you if the fellow's got a cent he's worth twenty million dollars abe drew pale say looky here why should i talk to mr stoyerman he besought you could do this without me morris don't be a baby abe morris retorted felix stay here with us and not me boys felix said i guess you got to excuse me i done enough already and if you don't get home right away change my underclothes which they're dripping wet with perspiration i could sure catch a bad cold he shook abe and morris warmly by the hand and hardly had the elevator door closed behind him when the showroom became a scene of nervous activity nathan abe yelled to the shipping clerk fetch the broom the place looks like a pigsty here he turned to morris with excited gesture do me the favor morris he said tell a couple of them young fellows from the cutting room to come in here them sample racks ain't been straightened up for a week i'm going around to the barber shop morris i'll be right back end of chapter seven part one end of section ten